Hello, my dear ladies. I'm happy to be here with you again. I'm Menopause Barbie, your menopause tailor, and I'm helping you tailor your menopause in a way that makes the rest of your life the best of your life. This is video number 248, and it's smack dab in the middle of a huge unit on Alzheimer's. If you're new to this channel, you should stop this video and go all the way back to video one and watch them in order. If all you care about is Alzheimer's, you should start at video 236 because that's where the Alzheimer's unit began. If you want to follow along in my book, you should go to chapter 33. <laughs> and if you just want to learn about the genetics of Alzheimer's, this is the video for you. It's the 13th video in the Alzheimer's unit. This video is important because there are different genetic mutations that cause Alzheimer's and they are not all the same. It is critical to know the differences, and that's what I'll teach you today. You know, genetics is a big deal these days. Not only do we have the ability to determine our genetic potential for various diseases, we also have the ability to implement all sorts of measures to decrease or negate the effect of our genes. Did you hear that? I just said you can decrease or negate the effect of your genes. Are you surprised? Well, let me explain by starting at the beginning. Genes are your body's hereditary code. You get half of them from your mother and half of them from your father. You have genes for every aspect of your being. Some genes are for things that you can physically see, like your eye color, your height, your hair color. The name for genes that show up in a way that's obvious is phenotype. Phenotype is your appearance as a result of the genes that express themselves outwardly. But you are much more than just the genes you can see. You have some genes that do not show up in a physical manner. They're part of your genetic code, but they are more like a secret code. And the name for them is genotype. Your genotype is the sum total of all the genes that make you, you, both the ones you can see and the ones you cannot see. So why is it that you can see some genes and you can't see others? Well, I just told you that you get half of them from your mother and the other half from your father. Does one of your parents have have stronger genes than the other? Actually, the answer is yes. <laughs> Here's why. Genes are either dominant or recessive. A dominant gene is a strong gene, and a recessive gene is a weak gene. For every single trait, there are dominant and recessive genes. And for every trait you possess, the ones that show up depend on whether or not you inherit the dominant or the recessive gene. Let me give you an example. We'll use eye color. When it comes to eye color, dark eyes are dominant. So let's designate dark eyes with a capital B for brown. And light eyes are recessive. So let's designate light eyes with a little b for blue. Dominant and recessive are terms that designate which of these two genes wins when they are coupled. In other words, these words refer to which color your eyes will be if you have one of each gene, one dominant and one recessive. So if the big B, the capital B for brown eyes is dominant, it means that any time you have a capital B with a smaller case B, the big B wins. Well, if the big B wins, then you'll have brown eyes even though you have both a big B and a little B. So big B, little B, capital B, lowercase b, will result in brown eyes. Of course, two big Bs will also result in brown eyes because all you have is the dominant brown eye gene. And since the little B for blue eyes is recessive, the only way you'll have blue eyes is if you have two little bees. So let's say that one of your parents has brown eyes 
and the other parent has blue eyes. It doesn't matter which parent has which color eyes. Well, when your father's sperm meets your mother's egg, there are four possibilities for your genotype. Remember, genotype is the hidden code, but it determines your phenotype, which is the physical eye color that you can see. So I'll demonstrate the four possibilities using a good old fashioned tic-tac-toe grid. This simple grid shows one parent across the top row, that's parent one, and it shows the other parent on the first column, that's parent two. Now, although each parent has only one eye color, either brown or blue, they each have two genes for eye color, and each parent donates only one of his or her two genes to you. So notice that there are four gray boxes that are empty. Those four gray boxes represent the four possible combinations of genes from your mother and father that will determine your eye color. So now let's replace parent one and parent two labels with the genes that your parents have for eye color. They will represent the genes that they can donate to you. And let's look at your eye color from two different scenarios. First, we'll look at your resulting eye color if the parent with brown eyes has two capital Bs. That's parent one. Here you see your parent with brown eyes in the top row, and that parent has two big Bs and brown eyes. And because that parent has two big Bs, he or she can only donate a big B to your eye color. So here's that parent's contribution to your eye color, just that one parent's. Your possible genotypes are represented by those four gray cells. You only end up with one of them, but there are four possibilities. And now we'll add the gene from your parent with the blue eyes in the far left column. That parent has two little Bs and blue eyes. And because that parent has two little bees, he or she can only donate a little bee to your eye color. Well, look at that. All four cells reveal your four possibilities as all the same. All four possible genotypes are the same. They all consist of one big B and one little B. So what you see is that the one and only possibility for your genotype or code for eye color is big B, little B. And when you have both a big B and a little B, the big B wins, it's dominant. So your eye color will be brown. Okay, now let's change the situation. What if the parent with brown eyes has a genotype of one big B and one little B instead of two big Bs? Our tic-tac-toe grid would look like this. The only change is that your parent in the top row has one big B and one little B, but his or her eyes are still brown. But that little B is the hidden recessive gene that doesn't show up physically. And now let's look at the four possibilities for the genotype of your eye color. Now you see that you have a 50% chance of having a big B and a little B, which would make your eyes brown. And you have a 50% chance of having two little Bs, which would make your eyes blue. So the hidden code or genotype can result in either eye color. The lesson here is that you can have genes that are hidden. So now let's move on to the genetics of Alzheimer's disease. For Alzheimer's, we'll talk about four different genetic mutations that can put you at varying degrees of increased risk for getting the disease. And those four genetic mutations fall into two categories. One category is early onset Alzheimer's. The other category is late onset Alzheimer's. The actual genetics are not as simple as what I showed you for eye color, but the basic principles of dominant versus recessive genes still apply. 
So here's the organization of what you'll learn today. There are three mutations for early onset Alzheimer's, and there is one mutation for late onset Alzheimer's. Here's a preview of what we'll cover. Don't worry, I'll explain the acronyms as we address them. The three mutations for early onset Alzheimer's are APP, PSEN1, PSEN2. And the one mutation for late onset Alzheimer's is APOE. Okay, let's go through them one by one. We'll start with the three mutations that put you at risk for early onset Alzheimer's. So let's first define early onset Alzheimer's. Early onset Alzheimer's is Alzheimer's disease that presents itself physically before the age of 65, commonly in your 40s or 50s. This accounts for only 1% of all Alzheimer's cases, and that 1% consists of all three of these different types of early onset mutations. Back in video 242 on Alzheimer's pathology, I taught you about some of the proteins that function abnormally in Alzheimer's. Well, the three types of early onset Alzheimer's involve mutations in different proteins. The differences between them are mostly academic because they all play out essentially the same way in terms of symptoms. And all these early onset types of Alzheimer's involve a dominant gene that becomes physically apparent early on. The first type of early onset Alzheimer's is caused by a gene mutation in the amyloid precursor protein. I introduced you to amyloid precursor protein in video 242. The acronym for it is APP. Amyloid precursor protein, or AMP, breaks into smaller pieces, some of which is the beta amyloid that causes the typical amyloid plaques that pollute an Alzheimer's brain. You see, this is why you have to watch these videos in order. I can only imagine how foreign this sounds to you if you haven't. <laughs> but if you have, you're perking along just fine right now. <laughs> when your amyloid precursor protein carries a mutation, it causes your brain to build up amyloid plaques early in life, and that makes it impossible for your brain to function normally. The second type of early onset Alzheimer's disease is due to a genetic mutation in a gene for the protein presenilin 1. Notice that the word presenilin sounds a lot like the words pre and senile. Put together. And the third type of early onset Alzheimer's disease is due to a genetic mutation in the gene for the protein presenilin 2. So early onset Alzheimer's is due to a gene mutation in either APP, PSEN1, or PSEN2. And they are all the result of a dominant gene for Alzheimer's that expresses itself early. So the question is, does a gene mutation for early onset Alzheimer's guarantee that you will get Alzheimer's? And unfortunately, the answer is yes. But everything is relative. Even though you may have a gene mutation that dictates your fate, how it plays itself out is something over which you may have more control than you might imagine. And shortly, I'll tell you more about why. For now, let's move on to late onset Alzheimer's. Late onset Alzheimer's is caused by a gene mutation in a protein called apolipoprotein E, abbreviated A-P-O-E. Apolipoprotein. Don't let complicated names intimidate you. Break them up and most of the time, you'll figure out a lot about them just by breaking them up and seeing what the components are. Apolipoproteins transport cholesterol particles in your bloodstream. That's why lipo is part of the name. Lipo means fat. You've probably heard of liposuction. People undergo liposuction to remove unwanted fat that does not respond to diet and exercise. So here you have 
APOE, which is apolipoprotein E. And it's a protein that transports fat in your bloodstream with special attention to the fat that is in myelin. Now, earlier I explained that you inherit one gene from each for each trait from your mother and another from your father. So you inherit one form of APOE from your mother and one from your father. And it turns out that there are three different forms of APOE. There's APOE2, APOE3, and APOE4. I don't know what happened to APOE1. <laughs> I taught you about the differences between a dominant gene and a recessive gene applies to these APOE genes. So APOE3 is the most common type because it's dominant. 60% of people have APOE3 from both parents. If you combine any of the others with APOE3, you end up exhibiting the APOE3 in your phenotype because it's dominant. So if your genotype is APOE2 and 3, or 3 and 3, or 3 and 4, you will exhibit the APOE3. The APOE3 neither increases nor decreases your risk for Alzheimer's. It's neutral. So what you manifest physically may be determined by what the APO3 is paired with, whether it's paired with 2 or 4. APOE2 and 4 are much less common. 20% of people have one or two copies of APOE2. And APOE2 actually decreases your risk for Alzheimer's. 20 to 30% of people have APOE4, either in combination with one of the others or two copies of it. And the form of APOE that increases your risk for Alzheimer's is APOE4. Your risk is increased if you have either one or two copies of APOE4. So you have a situation in which out of three possible APOE genes, the dominant one, APOE3, is neutral for Alzheimer's. The next most dominant one, APOE4, increases your risk for Alzheimer's. And the recessive one, APOE2, decreases your risk for Alzheimer's. Now, take a minute to notice something. We tend to think of dominance as a kind of superiority. It has a connotation of being a positive thing, but that is a fallacy. The words dominant and recessive do not translate into good and bad or into better and worse. Here you see that the recessive APOE2 gene is the most desirable, but it's recessive. But we want to focus on APOE4 because it's the only APOE mutation that increases your risk for Alzheimer's. If you have one copy of APOE4 gene, meaning you inherit it from only one of your parents, it increases your risk of Alzheimer's by three. That tells you that it's the dominant gene. And if you have two copies of the APOE4 gene, meaning you inherit, from both, from, inherit it from both your parents, it increases your risk of Alzheimer's by 10. So, if we make a tic-tac-toe grid for this, like we did for brown eyes versus blue eyes, it's a bit more complicated, but that never stops me. <laughs> it would look like this. All I have done here is place the three APOE genes across the first row and down the far left-hand column, just like I did with the Bs for eye color. 
Your mother contributes one and your father contributes the other. And I've color coded the cells to indicate that APOE2 in light green decreases your risk for Alzheimer's. APOE3 in yellow is neutral. And APOE4 in light pink increases your risk. And then in each cell, I have combined the genes from your mother and your father. The darkest green is an APOE2 gene from both parents, decreasing your risk a bunch. The next lightest shade of green is a combination of an APOE2 and an APOE3. Two decreases your risk, while three is neutral. So that's the next best scenario. After that is the brightest shade of green in the center cell, where you inherit APOE3 from both parents. And that's neutral, neither increasing nor decreasing your risk. And then you come to the cells that are a shade of pink. They all have at least one APOE4 gene, which increases your risk of Alzheimer's. The two lightest pink cells have only one APO4, and it's paired with APO2, APOE2 to decrease your risk. So one APOE4 increases your risk by three, but it's offset by the decreased risk imposed by the APOE2. But then you see the next darker shade of pink cells with an APOE3 gene and an APOE4 gene. The APOE3 is neutral, but the APOE4 still increases your risk by three. And finally, you see the one cell in the darkest shade of pink. That one indicates an APOE4 gene from both of your parents, and it carries a tenfold increased risk of Alzheimer's. So when you get one of those genetic testing kits like 23andMe, it tells you if you have one or two copies of the APOE4 gene. I don't think most people who get those tests understand a tenth of the results they deliver. So with all these different gene combinations and all their different probabilities of causing Alzheimer's, the question becomes, does a gene mutation for late onset Alzheimer's guarantee that you will get Alzheimer's? And fortunately, the answer is no. So you see that not only are there differences in early onset versus late onset disease in terms of likelihood of getting Alzheimer's, there are also differences in the likelihood of getting it depending on the type of APOE genes you have. And the big difference between APOE4 and the three types of early onset Alzheimer's is that inheriting the APOE4 gene does not guarantee that you will get Alzheimer's. Now, I know that this is a bit confusing. So let's pause here and review what you've learned thus far. Of course, the best way to do that is with a chart. <laughs> so here's a chart summarizing everything I've told you thus far in this video. Don't let the bright colors or the multiple rows and columns overwhelm you. I will walk you through this. In the first column, you see the various factors that differ for different genetic mutations that contribute to Alzheimer's. They include the name of the mutation, whether Alzheimer's is guaranteed by that mutation or not, the age of onset, whether the mutation increases or decreases your risk of Alzheimer's, the probability that you will get Alzheimer's, and the effect on the average risk of Alzheimer's. In the red color of the next three columns, you see the three forms of early onset Alzheimer's. They are all guarantees that you'll get the disease earlier than age 65 with a 100% probability. So they greatly increase your risk above the average risk 
of 1 and 6. The remainder of the chart addresses the different types of late onset Alzheimer's. And I've used the same color coding that I used with the grid of possible APOE gene combinations a few minutes ago. They are arranged in decreasing order of severity. So that's why the two copies of APOE4 are right next to the early onset types of Alzheimer's. But you see that none of the late onset Alzheimer's is a guarantee that you'll get the disease. And they range from increasing your risk by 10 times to actually decreasing your risk below the average of 1 in 6. So the critical thing now is to focus on the fact that there is such a wide variation in the effect of different gene mutations on your risk for Alzheimer's. The key to understanding all this variability is based on something called epigenetics. Epigenetics is how your genes interact with your environment and your lifestyle habits. So if you thought that your genes were an absolute edict and that there's nothing you can do to affect them, you are very wrong. The fact is that your genes are but a plan or a map, if you will. They're just like a map. Let's say I use this map to decide where to go. And according to the map, I have many options. I mean, look, there's different places I can go all over this map. I can choose to go to any number of destinations, but they will not all take me to the same, in the same direction or deliver me to the same place. What if, instead of following this red line here, I instead follow this green line here? Big difference in where I end up. If I do that, I won't end up where the red line takes me. Instead, I'll end up where the green line takes me. And that is precisely what epigenetics is all about. The principle of epigenetics says that despite the fact that your genes are a roadmap to a specific outcome or disease, you have the power to change that outcome. In other words, you do not have to follow the map. If you take a different path, you can completely change where you go. And in the case of genetic mutations for a disease, you can completely change the outcome designated by your genes. So while you cannot change the fact that early onset Alzheimer's gene mutations will eventually cause Alzheimer's, you can change how early in your life they do so. And even though you may have the APOE4 genetic mutation for Alzheimer's, you can do all sorts of things to decrease the likelihood of actually getting Alzheimer's. It's all up to you. So in a way, what happens to you is up to you. I know it may sound like magic, but it isn't. I don't believe in magic. I believe in science and facts. So don't assume that your fate is sealed with any of these mutations. What I'll be teaching you in the videos on management options for preventing Alzheimer's is all the different things you can do to decrease your risk of Alzheimer's regardless of your genetics. So while some aspects of this video were depressing, I sure hope that this last message is reassuring. This whole menopause education is about managing your menopause your way. And avoiding Alzheimer's is one thing we all want. So this is where I'll stop today. You now have a good foundation for understanding the genetics of Alzheimer's disease. The charts from today's tutorial are available if you want them. You can either click the link just below the screen, or you can go to menopausetailor.me to find all the charts I've ever made for you. And if you want personal help with this or with anything else, just schedule a consultation at menopausetailor.me and subscribe no matter what you do. Following me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram is an option too. And next week, we'll start our discussion on Alzheimer's and estrogen. It will encompass more than one video, and that topic is ultra important for all women. I will see you then. <laughs> Bye.